My name is Jeffrey Cam, and I'm the host of Digital Oil and Gas, the podcast that looks at the impact of digital technology on the oil and gas industry. If you want to discuss this week's topic further, or just stay in touch, you can always reach me at Jeffrey Can on Twitter or at JeffreyCan.com. This podcast is entitled The Drones Have It Oil and Gas Work Gives Way to Robots. Drones, or autonomous equipment, are finding a receptive market in the oil and gas sector. Of all of the digital technologies, drones deliver superior triple bottom line benefits. Moreover, it's in many oil and gas basins' best interests to accelerate autonomy solutions. Here's why. Where robots win and where they don't. What exactly is autonomous kit? Think of any piece of equipment that typically must have a human operator at the helm. Heavy haulers, delivery vehicles, cars, forklifts, airplanes, helicopters, rail locomotives, submersibles, yellow goods, rigs, cranes, ships. The list is almost endless. Digital advances are making it possible to dispense with operators or drivers of these mechanical contraptions, or at least dispense with having a human physically on board. These advances include complex mathematics, learning systems, sensors, data networks, cameras, robotics, and digital controllers that have fallen in price and expanded in capability to bring autonomous control to within grasp of most manufacturers. Autonomous kit wins where work to be done is some potent combination of extra dangerous, and so elaborate protections are needed to safeguard the humans, high volume routine, such as driving, or extra costly, perhaps by virtue of its location, such as deep underwater, or by virtue of the scarcity of the skills needed, as with airline pilots. There's a handful of public examples of trials underway for autonomous kit in public spaces, Google Cars, for example, Uber's taxis, and Tesla's driver assist. But there are many instances of real working and delivered autonomous equipment in use around the world. The oil industry has been slow to innovate directly in autonomous, and the adoption curve shows the usual stately pace. But it's coming. Autonomous kit takes longer to make a difference in those situations where risks are considered low, like painting, the work is not that routine, like nursing, and cost isn't a driver, such as cleaning. It's fair to say that markets as large as painting, nursing, and cleaning are attracting their share of investment money, though, from automation. What's puzzling is why oil and gas still has humans in the middle of their contraptions, given the fact that humans are inherently unreliable and risky things. One of the challenges facing the industry is the amount of training required to maintain and operate complex equipment in the face of a huge outflow of experienced employees. Some 50% of oil and gas workers retire in the next five years. At a minimum, gear should be much easier to learn and use. Great design means reducing the cognitive load to use the equipment. So why oil and gas? Well, the oil and gas sector is actually very well suited to exploring and adopting drones and robots. First, the work is dangerous. Fumes and vapors from the product asphyxiate and can ignite. The work location is frequently remote, harsh, or submerged driving up the cost of housing human operators. Well-trained human capital is now scarce because of the downsizing in the sector. And the sector is an avid consumer of the kind of gear that robots should be good at. Things like haulers, movers, and heavy lifters. The physical assets, the plants, and the pipelines are long-life assets that require steady and often routine attention, making payback easier. The work has lots of routine elements. Heavy haulers, for instance, trundering around mines or engineers driving around to inspect facilities. And finally, environments where autonomous kit can be deployed are not shared with public use infrastructure, which takes away some risks. Some oil and gas basins have other intrinsic features that make them conducive to autonomous equipment. These include a vigorous and technically capable supply chain, as in Canada and the United States, widespread network coverage, particularly in North America, generally high-cost labor, which you find in Canada and Australia, demanding safety regulations, again Canada and Australia, large installed base of infrastructure, which includes Canada, the United States, and again Australia, and finally, low technology transfer costs, which is more of a universal phenomenon now. The Australian examples. The land down under has an unusually impressive track record in innovating in the areas of autonomous equipment, mostly in mining, but there's one good example from the gas sector. Mining haulers. The big iron ore mines in far-off Western Australia are considered world leaders in adopting and developing the autonomous mine truck. 
These heavy haulers work in a well-defined and controlled space, an open-cut mine, where there's no one about but miners. The cost of a heavy hauler driver is magnificent. The crews work around the clock from fly-in, fly-out camps and travel from all over Australia. The mines pay for the travel, pay for the camps, and pay extra for the social costs. It's not hard to grasp the significance of moving away from human drivers on heavy haulers. Imagine having effectively a single driver who is learning constantly from the experience of driving all the haulers. That experience is captured and shared across all the haulers in real time, making the system constantly smarter and safer. Imagine a central control room where the operators are based that isn't on the mine site, but in a large city where operators want to live, improving turnover and absenteeism. Fewer drivers are needed, and a single driver can supervise multiple trucks at the same time. Imagine the positive impact on recruiting, training, and supervision. Now, imagine a shift change with no reduction in productivity, because the trucks actually don't stop trucking. The driver simply stands up, and her replacement takes over. And yes, there's lots of women in mine site hauling, because they're safer drivers than men. And imagine a far more uniform usage profile of the mining trucks, because an autonomous fleet would always operate precisely the same way, yielding precisely uniform brake usage. Imagine the ability to model out exact routing, which would translate into more precise field performance and more accurate business performance. I'm not at all surprised to see news stories about autonomous heavy haulers gaining traction in the Canadian oil sands mines. Aerial Drones The new gas fields in Queensland are using unmanned aerial vehicles, or UAVs, to fly inspection runs over the gas field assets, mostly gas wells. The wells are relatively low productivity, heavily regulated, remote, and numerous. The old model was to assign a field operator to a handful of wells and a visitation schedule. The ratio of operator to wells was low, perhaps 1 to 15, because of the extensive drive time to get to the wells. Well, operators were on the same kind of shift schedule as an offshore oil worker, two weeks on, two weeks off, drove enormous distances, creating a serious safety risk, and visited wells that needed no attention at all, leading to wasted effort. Initial drone trials led to the realization that aerial technology could do the job, but only with industrial-grade gear from serious players. The drones need to fly at night, so as not to disturb pastoral lands and the grazers. They need to fly quite high, several hundred meters, well out of sight, and therefore needed a strong power plant and high-end aeronautic controls. The drones carry a big payload, high-resolution digital cameras, emission sensors, LIDAR, moisture sensors, and so on. They take before and after photos to see how much vegetation has grown, if the well has been flooded, and if it's been damaged by some frisky kangaroos. They plug into work systems that create the next day's work roster, including what wells need to be visited and why, what parts to load on the operator's truck, and even the order to visit the wells based on landowner access permits and at least total driving distances. The payoff is significant. A single drone can fly over and inspect more than 100 wells each flight whereas an operator might just visit six per day. Demanning the gas field delivers all the same HR benefits as autonomous haulers, with better safety outcomes because there's less driving. Of course, pilots aren't cheap either, but there's far fewer needed, and because of their training and flight operations, they are inherently safety conscious. UAVs could have a big impact on the huge and widespread oil and gas infrastructure that is typical in the Canadian and U.S. oil and gas fields, such as the Western Canadian Sedimentary Basin and the newer unconventional fields of the Permian and the Eagleford. Yes, UAVs could help make a step change in cost, productivity, and safety performance in oil and gas. There are lots of other great examples that oil and gas could embrace. Fully autonomous underwater drones for maintaining subsurface plant the completely human-free container port facilities that operate lights out, but with trucks and cranes loading and unloading containers around the clock. The autonomous drill rig that cuts the human operator headcount from dozens to a handful. And the robot trials for carrying out tank inspections and welding jobs during turnarounds. And finally, the UAVs that do flare stack inspections, which is a particularly hazardous and nasty job. So what's next? Well, autonomous gear is stepping onto Moore's Law and will fall in cost while improving in capability every 18 months or so. If you're a supply company, you need to be asking what drones will do to your current product and service offering. If you're an operator, you need to be asking what robots will do to your cost and productivity profile. Either way, your organization needs to be asking about what autonomy is going to do.
Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this podcast, be sure to subscribe to the show. You can find Digital Oil & Gas on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And please tell a friend about the show. If you have a minute, please leave a review and a rating on iTunes, as that helps others find the show along with other great content. You can follow Jeffrey on Twitter, at Jeffrey Can, or on LinkedIn. Also, look for Jeffrey's new book, entitled Bits, Bites, and Barrels, The Digital Transformation of Oil and Gas, on Amazon and other fine online bookshops. Thanks for listening to this episode of Digital Oil and Gas. The podcast returns next Wednesday, so tune in then.